Good morning again. Thank you for those of you that are joining us online this morning. And I do want to take just a moment here at the beginning uh, to say a, a great thank you to all of you for your prayers this week for Geraldine. It's been a trying, trying week, uh, trying 10 days actually. Uh, began last Thursday night when we were out of town and then through Thanksgiving week. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you, I either don't have your email or you're not reading them. So I'll let you sort that out. <laughs> hey, but thank you for your prayers and all of your text and in your encouragement. And I'll speak some more of that at the end of the message. Uh, it's something the Lord wants me to share at the end. So, but just thank you for that. She is not here this morning. She is adjusting to um, uh, the new meds that they have put her on. It's quite an adjustment period. And so continue to pray for her. She's not had any more angina since uh, Thursday. I uh, said it's Friday. I'm sorry. Uh, and, um, and I'll share some more on that later, but just continue to pray for her, and thank you so much for your faithfulness and your, and your prayers. This morning, we begin our message on um, our, our series on more to Christmas. H- how many of you know that there is more to Christmas than we normally ever, ever celebrate or ever acknowledge or even ever know? And so this season, it is Advent season, Christmas Advent. That is the Sundays between Thanksgiving and Christmas Day. Uh, and that, that season, historically for the Christian church, is a season of reflection and preparation for the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. I mean, something as monumentous, as momentous as the, as, as the birth of Jesus Christ, the birth of the Son of God, ought to take some reflection and preparation that we celebrate it properly, right? And so this season, I want us to talk about the fact that there is more to Christmas and how that, that prepares us to truly celebrate Christ. And with this morning's message, I want to I uh, give you a, bring to you a message entitled Christmas Hope. Christmas Hope. There's never been in my lifetime a time to need to stop and reflect on the hope that came when Jesus Christ was born. Amen? So this morning, I want us to do that by taking a look at a couple of Isaiah's prophecy and then a passage from Matthew. I want to read these now so that when I refer to them in a moment, you will hear them. Isaiah, the seventh chapter, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, 2 through 7. This is to be the longest passage that I'll read this morning. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep, deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. As for in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, and the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on his David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And then writing about that in Matthew, Matthew quotes Isaiah and says this. Matthew 1, 22. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you this morning for the privilege of bringing your word on this first Sunday of Christmas Advent as we look forward to celebrating the birth of Christ. I pray that you'd come into this room right now and those, the homes of those that are online and to all of our hearts and let us, Lord, explore this hope that we have been given. I thank you and I praise you for it and let it speak hope into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to take just a few moments this morning and uh, and talk about uh, prophecy just for a moment because it's going to set up what I'm going to say. There are, according to uh, uh, Old Testament scholars, there are somewhere between 300 and 350 uh, prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled. Now, I just want you to think about what I just said there a moment. 
somewhere between 300 and 350 Old Testament prophecies that was given 700 years before Jesus came and he fulfilled every single one of them. Hello? There are a handful that have yet to be fulfilled that will be fulfilled at his second coming, but he fulfilled every one of them. There was a professor at the University of Pasadena, California, a professor of mathematics and, um, and uh, astronomy. And uh, he and 600 graduate students uh, undertook a project to calculate the probability of one person fulfilling just eight. They took just eight. Now remember, Jesus fulfilled uh, well over 300 prophecies, but they took the probability of him fulfilling just eight of the more important prophecies. Are you tracking with me now? I know we're getting into probability and math, and some of your eyes are glazing over, and you're getting a little faint-headed. But, but just, just stick with me here for a moment. They estimated, and they, and they used conservative estimates. In other words, the numbers they put out, they wanted to, to uh, a- absolutely be as accurate as possible, but not overestimate. So they used very conservative estimates and the, uh, the probability of one man 700 years later fulfilling just eight of those prophecies. The chance is a staggering one in 10 to the 17th power. That, that, that is 10 followed by 17 zeros. Now, in order to make that accessible to you and I, because when you say 10 to 17 zeros, that means like nothing to me, right? So to do that, they, they uh, came up with this illustration and, um, and calculated the same probability that if you took, watch this now, if you took silver dollars and covered the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet thick, and you took one of those silver dollars, and you put a big red X on it, and you threw it in the middle of, that, uh, of all of those silver dollars, and you took a man, and you blindfolded him, <laughs> and you told him he had one chance to pick up one coin, and he would pick up the one coin that had the X on it, would be the same probability of a man being born 700 years later and fulfilling just eight of those, pro- of those prophecies, and Jesus fulfilled nearly 350 of them. Can somebody say, Jesus is Lord? Amen? Yes. I mean, you just, you're going to have to digest that and process that some this afternoon, Right? The point that I'm making this morning, the reason I draw us attention to that is that I want to draw our attention to the fact of the faithfulness of God in promising the Messiah and giving those promises 700 years ago and then sending that Messiah in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin Mary, and then fulfilling every one of those prophecies for you and I that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. My goodness, that takes some reflection and preparation to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ when you realize the faithfulness of God in it. Amen? So I want to talk with you just for a minute about this prophecy, and, and, then, and then I'm going to make it real to us with some practical application. First of all, I want you to understand the, the darkness of the prophecy. If you go back to Isaiah's prophecy, and you don't have to refer back to, uh, to, uh, to that place now, but I just want to draw, pull some things out of, out of that prophecy there. This prophecy was given by Isaiah in a very dark period of Israel. They were, it speaks of a yoke which means political domination. They were dominated at every level during this season. It was a dark period in the nation, in the history of the nation of Israel. It speaks of a yoke, which is political domination. It speaks of a warrior's boot, which, which is military domination. It speaks of garments uh, being rolled in blood, which speaks of the cost of the domination. It speaks of people walking in darkness or a land of deep darkness, speaking of the depth of the domination. Do you understand uh, what is going on? This is, there is darkness all throughout this prophecy. It was a dark period and a dark time. That's what this prophecy is about. But in the midst of that, watch this this morning, in the midst of that, God gives a prophecy of hope. Aren't you glad this morning that in the midst of darkness, God gives a promise of hope? Hello, come on, somebody. In the midst of darkness, whatever that darkness may be, God gives a prophecy, a promise of hope. 
So the darkness of this prophecy, prophecy was great. But I want to point you also to the light of this prophecy. There is a, there's certainly darkness in this prophecy. But think, just go back and read Isaiah 2, uh, I'm sorry, 9, 2 through 7 again this afternoon or sometime this week. And look at the, look at the light of the prophecy. Notice the light. It speaks of a great light. It speaks of a time when light dawned. It speaks of a time, now remember, it is utter darkness. They are being dominated, but God has given a prophecy, a promise of great light, of light dawning, of an increased joy. It speaks of, a re, of rejoicing so much as though it were the harvest. And remember, they are dominated, completely dominated, and yet God's given them a promise that will make them rejoice as though a great harvest has just come in. Do you see the light of the prophecy? It talks of shattering the yoke and shattering the bar that, that is on their backs. It talks of burning the warrior's boots and burning the warrior's garments as fuel for fire. Hello? And then, after all of that, he says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I am so glad that in darkness, God gives a hope of light, a prophecy of light, a promise of light. Oh, my goodness, church. See, there is more to Christmas. When, the, when Christ the child was born in the manger, there is more to Christmas. There is this whole prophecy of darkness and this prophecy of light in the midst of that darkness. Then we speak here not only of the uh, we see the darkness of the prophecy and the light of the prophecy, but I want to talk to you just for a moment about the fulfillment of the prophecy. See, 700 plus years later, somewhere around 712 years later, depending on the timing, the timing of Isaiah's, when it, when it was written, uh, the dating of Isaiah's book, there is about a 30 or 40 year difference in opinion as to when it was written. But somewhere over 700 years later, it is another dark time in the, in the history of Israel. Israel now is not under the boot of Assyria, but now they are under the boot of Roman, of the Roman government. The Roman government has installed a puppet government there, and that government uh, uh, is under, under the thumb of the Roman government. It is a, it is a dark uh, period. They have no political freedom. They have religious freedom, but don't get too excited about it because if, it's too, if, it, if it causes an uproar, we, we may have to come in and put a stop to it. They are under the Roman imperialism. And the word tells us, and when the time had been fulfilled, or when the time was right, God sent Jesus Christ, his son, to be the savior of the world and to deliver his people from their sins. You see, in that moment in time, that prophecy that was given of dark prophecy, uh, uh, the darkness of the event, and yet the light that was promised to come, in that moment, God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to fulfill all of those prophecies of light in the midst of darkness. And he does it in the midst of another time of darkness such that Jesus Christ has come and is born. Just think with it for a moment. Let me just name four or five. Let me just name four or five of the prophecies. That Jesus, you see, Jesus was absolutely intent that they understand his faithfulness in the midst of the situation. First of all, uh, Jesus was virgin born. That was one of the prophecies that Isaiah gave, that Jesus was virgin born. Medical science says it's impossible. The atheist says it doesn't happen. But I'm so glad God doesn't consult medical science or the atheist or the news channel or popular culture. God does what only God can do. And what is impossible with man is possible with God and he sends Jesus Christ born of a virgin Mary wow born human second prophecy that he would be born human he would come in the form of a man Philip Paul talks about this in Philippians that he came and he took on the form of a of human the form of a servant obedient unto death Philippians chapter 2 obedient unto death even the death of the cross and other prophecies that he would be born. You see, Jesus left, Jesus left nothing. Jesus, I'm sorry, God left nothing up to chance here. 700 years ago, Jesus not on, God not only prophesied that he would be born of a virgin, that he would be born human, but the very 
place, the very city that he would be born in Bethlehem. Are you tracking with me this morning? God wants you to see his faithfulness in the birth of Jesus Christ. That he was born in Bethlehem. That he would be born a descendant. It was prophesied that he would be born a descendant of Abraham. That is, that he would be in the Jewish lineage. That he would be born of the tribe of Judah. That he would come in the line, uh, in the line of David. Prophesied that his name would be called Jesus, but that he would be called Emmanuel, that God is with us. That he would be the light of the world. Are you hearing all the prophecies that Jesus, that God is fulfilling here? That he would come. He didn't just say, um, he didn't, didn't just tell how he would come and where he would come and what his family would be and what his name would be and that he would be the light of the world. But he also said the timing. The timing will be between the uh, rebuilding of the second temple and the destruction of it by the Roman. And right in that period, Jesus came. God wants us to see his faithfulness in the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just take just a moment here and just talk with you just for a moment about this observation. I'll just some observations that I want to give you this morning, this practical to our lives about God's faithfulness and our hope. You do understand that God's faithfulness and our hope are absolutely connected in a way that cannot be separated. Let me talk to you about the God's faithfulness and our hope just here, just for a moment. Some observation about God's faithfulness and our hope. God's faithfulness comes in the darkness. God's faithfulness comes in the darkness. You see, God is faithful in the darkness. In fact, to Christmas, the original Christmas, you do understand, I know that we, we celebrate Christmas as a season of light, and it is a season of light. Uh, I, I get that. I, I understand that. But you, do, you understand the first Christmas was a dark period and a dark time that I have just spoke about a few moments ago. And so here's, here's what I'm wanting us to hear and to see uh, this morning for us and for our own lives, and that is this. Just because it is dark does not mean God's not faithful. Just because you're facing a dark period doesn't mean God's not faithful. Just because darkness seems to come doesn't mean God is not faithful. Christmas began in darkness, but Christmas ended with Jesus Christ, the light of the world coming. So I want to encourage you this morning. You may be in a season of darkness, a time of darkness, a place of darkness. I want to tell you this morning that the darkness does not diminish the faith faithfulness of God. Amen. Speaking of faithfulness, you understand, don't you? God is, God is faithful in the darkness. The darkness does not diminish the faithfulness of God, and it should not diminish our hope because of the faithfulness of God. See, think about, think about it for a moment. Let me just, let me just give you a, a few examples this morning. That have to do with God's faithfulness. You, uh, listen, why, Pastor, why are you so certain that God is faithful? Well, one is this. God keeps his promises. Amen. He made 350 of them to the nation of Israel, and Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. I am so glad that the promises of God are yea, that means yes, and amen, which means let it be so. I, I am glad that God is a God of his word. I, I am absolutely confident in his faithfulness faithfulness because he has always been a God of his word. He has always kept his promises to me and to you. And some of you are shaking your head because you can remember some promises given by God and he is faithful to keep them every single one. Amen. Oh, I'm confident of his faithfulness because he's a, he's a God who keeps his promises. And these are just a few. I could go on and on and on, but let me just mention two or three more. I am confident of God's faithfulness. Because God makes a way when there is no other way. Hello? Anybody been in a situation where there was no other way? Anybody been with your back against the wall where there was no other way? And yet God finds a way to come through. So many times I've been in places where there just was no way and yet God made a way. I am confident of his faithfulness because time and time and time again when there was no way, when the diagnosis said different or the outlook said different or the forecast said different. Time and time again, God makes a way when there is no way. That's why I'm confident of his faithfulness. Amen. Hmm. In fact, I love it. Matthew 19, 26, 26 says, with man, 
things are impossible, but with God, nothing is, or all things are impossible. I'll tell you another reason I'm confident in God's, God's faithfulness, and it is because God is present. You know, sometimes I, I am thankful, and I've been the recipient of those times when God keeps his promises, and God's fi- those times when God has made a way when there was no way, and you know, you, uh, you that are familiar with my, my history, my health history, know that I'm a recipient of that. But can I tell you, even above and beyond that, and I know that sounds kind of astounding when you know some of what, what we've been through. Even above that, can I tell you something that convinces me of his faithfulness even more? And that is that God has always been present. He has always been there. He is, there's never been a time, there's never been an occasion. In fact, Jesus says, I, he says, lo, I am with you always, even until the ends of the earth. I, you know why I'm confident of God's faithfulness? There's never been a time that I need him, he wasn't there. There's never been a time when I, listen, when I mess my own life up that he was still there, hello, come on now, let's just be honest. There never been a time when I found myself in a situation that somebody else messed up, hello, right? Some, some of it's my doings, but some of it's others' doings. I am glad that God's present, Mike, in the middle of it all. He has never left me. He's never forsaken me. I am confident of his faithfulness because he has always been there. Pastor, you mean always? Every single time he has been there. Let me just mention to you one more thing that makes me confident of his faithfulness. And that is faithful is his name. <laughs> Come on, church. Faithful is his name. Roman, uh, Revelation 19 and 11 says, um, John is looking. He says, I saw in heaven, I saw in heaven standing open before me a white horse and the rider on it. His name was Faithful and True. Written on his garment is his name, Faithful and True. I am so glad, Paul, that his name is Faithful. Faithful, hallelujah, and his name is true. I am confident of his faithfulness because that's his name. He can't be anything but faithful, hello? That's who he is. So there's this connection between darkness and faithfulness, and finally there's this connection with hope. You see, God's faithfulness, listen to me this morning, God's faithfulness in the darkness is what gives me hope. God's faithfulness in the darkness is what gives me hope. I have hope because God is faithful. I don't have hope because of what the media says or social media says. I don't have hope because of what somebody's agenda says. I have hope because of the faithfulness of God. Gerald and I were watching an old movie, and I knew this was the message that I was preaching. And several days ago, we were watching an old movie. And in it, it, there's a widower who has kind of lost his way. Since the passing of his wife, he's kind of lost his way, he's a widower, and, and um, part of that story is about him finding his way again, and he's speaking to a younger man who's really trying to find his way in life. He says, sir, how did you, how did you ever put it all together? He says, here's what I found, here's what I found. Hope begins when you're standing in the darkness looking out at the light. Here. Light doesn't, listen, hope doesn't happen when you step into the light. Hope happens when you're standing in the darkness and you're looking loud at the light. (laughs) Hello, church. And I'm going to tell you this morning, it is true. It is true of the birth of Jesus Christ. There's a sense in which we at some, in some ways are still standing in some darkness because we live in a dark world. But my eyes are looking out at the light. My eyes are looking to the one who is light. My eyes are looking to the one who is faithful and is true. And because of his faithfulness, I have hope, my friend. I have hope. Hello? Wow. You see, you see, God's faithfulness is the darkness is what gives me hope for the light. God is, com- here's the point that I'm trying to make this morning. God is completely faithful. He's faithful in word. He's faithful in deed. He's faithful in judgment. He's faithful in his sovereignty. He's faithful in his promises. He's faithful in his gifts. He's faithful in his salvation. He's faithful in his mercy. He's faithful in his grace. He's faithful in his healing. He's faithful in his 
his provision and he will be faithful in his coming. He is absolutely faithful. And that reminds me of the hope that I have in God, right? See, Christmas reminds us of that hope because of God's faithfulness. So this morning, this morning, as we, as we reflect, as we prepare our hearts for this Christmas season this morning, because of God's faithfulness, I want us to consider just for a moment. You see, here's the thing. God's faithfulness in the past gives me hope in the present and for the future. Right? Write it down. God's faithfulness in the past gives me hope for the present, in the present, and for the future. So this morning, I want to give you five, just four, four, uh, I'm sorry, five practical things you can do. I'm going to make this quick. Five practical things that you can do this morning that reflect on God's faithfulness and can give you hope. If you take your notes, write these four, write these four, these five words down. The first word is small. Small. I'm talking about how we can practically apply what I'm talking about, what I've been talking about this morning, to reflect on God's faithfulness and how that builds our trust and our hope in Him. First of all, small. Think of something small that God has done for you. So easy to overlook the small things, isn't it? Pastor, why, why look at the small things? Because the small things so many times demonstrates God's love and His care for you, Right? Think of something small. This week, think of something small. A a card someone sent, a text they sent, a phone call they made, a visit that they made. And you know what will happen is you begin to think, Lynn, of all the small things that God's done for you. You will realize there's a whole huge pile of small things that God's done for you. And what will it do? It will speak of God's faithfulness, of his love, of his care for you, and it will build your hope. Amen? So think of something small. Second thing is that is to do, if you wanted to reflect on God's faithfulness and it builds your hope, think of something unexpected. Anybody but me, anybody but me this morning, where God did something unexpected for you, <laughs> hello, and it just, I mean, it just came out of nowhere. It was, it is unexpected. Uh, you see, this morning, maybe, maybe it was a gift or an act of kindness. Jerry and I received a phone call about a month ago, and someone that we pastored many, many years ago, over, over 20, uh, uh, nearly 20 years ago that we pastored, they did something unexpected for us. It wasn't monetary, uh, but, but it was something that they did completely and totally unexpected. And, and when we got off the phone with this individual, we could not help but just smile at God's faithful. Think of something unexpected. Think of something small. Think of something unexpected. And I'm going to add one here. This is not in my notes. It's just as I'm preaching, it's just occurred to me. Think of something undeserved. Mm. Wow. <laughs> you talk about faithfulness. Mm. How many undeserved things has God given and done for me? It speak that, listen, that speaks of his faithfulness, not mine. That speaks of his character, not mine. Think of something small. Think of something unexpected. Think of something undeserved. And then, flipping the script a little bit, think of your answered prayers. I am firmly convinced I am firmly convinced that people who do not think God answers prayers are people who fail to remember the prayers he's answered. In fact, I challenge you to do something. Start a list. Start a list of answered prayers. I I challenge you to spend the next year making a list of the prayers you prayed and and how God answered those prayers and put a date by you. You will listen. What you will find out, you see, where the small things demonstrate God's love and care, and the unexpected things uh, demonstrates that God is thinking about you, and the undeserved things demonstrate God's character. The answered prayer demonstrate that God is listening. God is listening. Then think of, so you think of the small things, the unexpected, the undeserved, the answered prayer. Then think of the life changing. I look around this room. And there's not a person here 
that has a God, had God do something life changing for you. Those are easy to remember, but we should also think about them. Maybe it was the disaster that was averted, or the healing that came, or the miracle that came, or the provision that came, or salvation. You see, these demonstrate God's power in your life. Think of the small, think of the unexpected. Think of the undeserved. Think of the answered prayer. Think of the life changing. And in all of that, think of Jesus. Right? The gift. The gift which the Father gave to us, which demonstrates his faithfulness. Amen? I want to take just a moment here. Take just a moment here. And just share with you a little bit um, about the last 10 days. For those that don't know, uh, 10 days ago, Geraldine uh, began to experience angina. We now know that she was experiencing that prior. We didn't identify it as such. But on Thursday night, um, a week ago, we were in Missouri. We were with the kids, and we were walking along um, fairly steep hill up into a place where we were going to view some Christmas lights and she, 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 had to, she just had to stop it she the, and Johnny in her chest her pain shooting down both arms up into her neck and in her back we now probably know that we probably should have called the ambulance she just stopped three times she had to stop to get up the hill eventually it subsided and then the next night uh, when we got home um She began to experience the angina, just carrying some things from the car into the house. And then last Sunday afternoon, she began to experience that, just putting some sheets on the bed. So you see the progression that is there. We knew then that her words, she said, I I knew I was in trouble then. So that morning, we went to the doctor's office. Uh, We were there early. We We were actually there waiting on them to get there. And we went straight in and miraculously the doctor took us first and as he began to hear what Geraldine was experiencing and what she was going through and Geraldine's family history for those who don't know Geraldine's family history when we began to tell her that Geraldine's dad had his first heart attack at 49 her granddad died of a massive fatal heart attack at 53 her great granddad died of a massive heart attack at 49 when he began to hear that his eyes just get bigger right he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you, you're, you're not going home. Glenn can go home and get you. We're putting you straight in the hospital. And before we ever left the room, he picked up his phone. He personally called a cardiologist. He said, are you working? Are you at the hospital? I need you to see this lady today. We get to the hospital and the cardiologist comes in within just a few moments. And listen, that's God's favor. <laughs> Hello. That they admit you straight to the hospital. That a doctor makes a personal phone call and... And the cardiologist there within minutes and when he walks out of the room the nurses just come in and they're hooking her up to IVs and starting her on heparin and other things to make sure she doesn't uh, go into cardiac arrest and um, he goes out and he studies everything he comes back in a little bit he says we're 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 going straight to a heart cath he says there's we're, we're bypassing all of the other tests we've got a cath you and then he begins to prepare us three different times he had this conversation with us he was convinced he was going to find multiple blockages and possible open heart surgery. Geraldine was scared to death. Three other times he said, if I get in there and find what I may find, I will back out and we'll have a conversation before we proceed. It took two days because there were, believe it or not, more dire emergencies <laughs> But listen, side note, just side note, just, just a thing. When, when a doctor or a medical professional or somebody's caring for you and they're tended to emergency, just be careful you're not the emergency. Just, that's just a side note. Did the car catheterization finally got to it? They were not as concerned uh, immediately because they had her on the medicines that would prevent something worse happening. So they got in and... and <laughs> cardiologist came out and he and he says he says I I have to swallow my pride because I was absolutely convinced 
that she was going to have multiple blockages. He said, but her arteries are wide open. Hello? That's his words. Wide open. And he was so amazed by it. He got it up on the screen and he showed the animation of it from several different angles. And so he says, here, right here's where I expected it. I knew it was going to be right there, but you can see it's wide open. And if it wasn't there, here's where I knew it was going to be. But it's wide open. Wow. But immediately he ordered an echo because he thought, I've missed something. He said, he, I, I, we, I don't know what we've missed. So he immediately ordered an echo. Um, to, to see the heart function, the heart infraction, the heart function has something previously happened. Even though the MI labs so she had not had a heart attack, have we missed something? Immediately he orders an echo and, and he comes back in a little while and I said, what's the, what's the verdict of the echo? And he said, quote, it's stone cold normal. That, listen, that's what you want a doctor to tell you your echo is stone cold normal. Hello? But it doesn't, God's faithfulness doesn't just stop there. What they did end up diagnosing Geraldine is Prinz metal angina, which is where the arteries spasm and block off blood flow. She was actually having angina. It can lead to heart damage and a heart attack. And here's the thing. It is incredibly difficult to diagnose. And most of the time, it is diagnosed after some terrible health event. But as he was cathing her, he physically observed her artery spasming so that we can get on the front of it rather than treating it behind it. Can I tell you something this morning? God is faithful. He is faithful. I do ask you to continue to pray for her. The meds they have put her on, first of all, we're believing for a complete restoration and healing. We are thankful for the good reports. But as we try to be wise and follow the doctor's advice, these getting used to these meds, it's a pretty tough process. She's in the middle of that right now, but thank you for that. I just want to tell you this morning, God is faithful. And we couldn't help but reflect as we were there the last day when they were about to release us. The next day was Thanksgiving. And we couldn't help but reflect. And I just said to her, I said, you know, we got a way of messing up Thanksgiving. Because <laughs> as you remember, seven years ago, Thanksgiving seven years ago, was when I was in the hospital with a brain hemorrhage. Aren't you glad? God doesn't deal in family history. He doesn't deal in trends. God deals in individuals. God deals in miracles. God deals in faithfulness. In fact, I want to give you, it's, I've added this, I've started memorizing Scripture again. I mean, diligently, purposely memorizing Scripture again. And I've added this to my memory verse. I want to share it with you, and I'm going to quit. I'm going to close this morning. Here it is. Romans chapter 15, verse 33. May the God of, all, of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hello? Anybody here want to claim that verse this morning? Yeah, that's my prayer for you this Christmas season, is that as you reflect on the birth of Jesus Christ, that may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer for you this morning. So here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to consider God's faithfulness, and you will discover hope. Consider God's faithfulness. That's the main idea of the whole message this morning. Consider God's faithfulness, and you will discover hope. Will you stand up with me? Father, I thank you this morning for your faithfulness. Lord, Lord, to every one of us that is here, to every one of us that is listening online, to everyone that will be listening, Lord, on YouTube later, Lord, we thank you for our faithfulness. It's my prayer, God, that you will fill us with joy and peace as we put our trust in you and that that will overflow in hope this Christmas season. May we be beacons of hope. May we be lighthouses of hope. We understand the darkness of the world, but we understand the faithfulness of our God more. And may it fill us with hope this season. Amen. We draw strength from that hope.
We thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. Gerald and I both look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. All of the activities start back up this Wednesday night. Kids, teens, men's, and women's. And I look forward to seeing you Friday night, 6.30, Christmas decorating party, and then next Sunday. Till we see you again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the blessings of the Lord. God bless you. We love you.